I am first and foremost a nerd slash slightly geeky tendencies. When I was a little girl, I wanted to be a flight attendant. I wish I wanted to be a pilot, but I happen <laughs> to want to be a flight attendant. <laughs> she was very understanding of her different people in her group with different personalities. I didn't see how I could uh, fit in the um, academic arena. In this video, we're going to present you the four female researchers and how they did end up in Amsterdam. The thing that shocked me about this question, uh, because you mentioned that you don't want research topics, what happens a lot uh, to academics is that we tend to find ourselves defined by research. So I was trying to think, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> I would describe myself as a very stubborn, uh, obsessive person uh, that is in love with physics and has strong opinions. I am first and foremost a nerd slash slightly geeky tendencies. I would say I love science fiction. I get really ever enthusiastic about space rockets and fantasy novels and gaming and all this kind of stuff. I am also a very picky scientist. <laughs> I will say that's the key part of who I am. And I am a mom and I have two amazing, wonderful children who make me laugh all the time, who are just fantastic. And I'm a migrant, which I think is also important. Basically, originally from the UK, I've lived all over the world and now I'm settled here. I think I'm a relatively ambitious person and I put a lot of value in how I perform in my job. But I also really like to do any number of puzzles and uh, board, play board games and play the piano. And I also find that the things I like in those also are the things that I like in doing physics. So I also I work at NWO, the Dutch Research Council. I coordinate everything what has to do with diversity and inclusion and equity uh, concerning granting. And my other role at NWO is I also coordinate uh, AI research programs. So that's something completely different. I combine those two areas. When I was a little girl, like a teenager, roughly, I I had this drive to like see the world. I wanted to travel. I, I wanted to like go out and have a profession that would allow me to travel. And based on the circumstances and what I was exposed to, it meant that when I was a little girl, I wanted to be a flight attendant. <laughs> Which makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense, right? Yeah. yeah. I wish I wanted to be a pilot, but I happen <laughs> to want to be a flight attendant. <laughs> That was the, the picture that, that existed there. Exactly. Yeah. That, that was like the image of like, oh, who are women that travel the world? Yeah, exactly. Uh, flight attendants travel the world. So I wanted to do that. But then uh, what happened uh, as I was growing up is that I also found uh, mathematics very interesting. I, I started having that passion for quantitative uh, analytic subjects. And one day I stumble into a news article in a travel magazine about a Chilean astronomer. So I'm from Chile uh, originally, that's where I grew up. And the thing that they were profiling her as an astronomer about how many different places in the world she studied, she worked, she visited all these observatories that were in like uh, remote places. <laughs> and I'm like, that's fascinating. I wanna be an astronomer. <laughs> <laughs> I can do like uh, science and travel and so that that actually was a big uh, force for me to decide to go into astronomy so my bachelor is in astronomy but i had no idea what i was getting myself into i just thought i had the right attitudes because i was good at math in high school and and it seemed uh, and i did not want it to be an engineer i refused to go to engineering school so i went into astronomy and in that process i discovered that physics was also was actually my 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 passion, what interested more, theoretical physics in particular. At, at that stage, I already understood that an, an academic life, regardless of the subject, <laughs> so, as I learned more about what it meant to be an academic, a scientist, that uh, all of these pro professions like allow you to visit different universities, go do studies and, and different places in the world. And so I, I wasn't compromising on that dream. When I was at high school, I had originally thought I would do history or something like that. And then I got, my attention got caught by a poster for European Space School, which was up in the physics corridor. And I thought, oh, that sounds kind of cool. 
And I'd already kind of gone towards sciencey subjects because I like those as well. It's like, okay, space sounds fun. So I went, I went and did the summer, summer course. Um, and the advice I got there was, you know, don't go to space science straight away, do physics first and then go from there. I knew I wanted to do science, but mostly because all of my family is in STEM subjects. And also because of uh, where I grew up. So, so in, in Iran, it's uh, very sort of desirable to do engineering or to do um, medicine. And so I sort of thought that that's what I would do. And then, um, yeah, and then I thought, and it wasn't, it wasn't very difficult. By uh, education, I'm, I'm a biologist. I had my uh, PhD at uh, UFA. Uh, when I was about to finish my PhD, of course, I started to think about my future. And I realized that I would have to compete with uh, very competitive groups in the US, for instance. So I was in the middle of having a family, little, little children, young children. So I, I really, I, I didn't, I didn't see how I could uh, fit in the um, academic arena, how I could combine it with my personal life. And so that took me abroad. So I first moved to the US for graduate school. And then after that, I lived in the US, I lived in Canada. And then around that time, I was a postdoc. There was a job opening in Amsterdam. I had visited before as a tourist. Mm -hmm. I knew the group was excellent here. The string theory group was very, very strong. Um, and I'm like, I, I should apply. And they made me an offer. <laughs> That's yeah. how I ended up here. <laughs> so I applied for various physics degrees. I got into Oxford. I did my bachelor there for three years, which is an amazing place to be. Um, but I wasn't, I, I didn't fall out of Oxford thinking this is for me. I fell out of thinking, oh, astronomy was not as fun as I thought it would be. <laughs> so I then couldn't really decide what to do next. So I applied for a couple of master's programs and I thought about doing a PhD, but then I actually went to work for five years. I worked for the British government um, as a civil servant for the Ministry of Defence. They had a kind of science fast track scheme to try and get you through to high levels of the civil service quite fast. So five years there, um, some very good things came out of it. I met my husband there, so bonus. Um, but at the end of five years, I found myself thinking, I'm a bit bored. It's a busy job, a lot of responsibility, but I'm not really enjoying it terribly much. And so I then started to look around for something else. And I then decided to come back and do a PhD. Um, and I looked at various different places, found a, a nice project in a relativity group in Southampton, working on neutron star oscillations, actually a PhD in the maths department. Um, my employer gave me three years holiday to go and do the PhD with the intention that if I wanted to come back, I, could, I, so I always had that little safety net, um, but I loved it. I ended up saying from there, I went to do a postdoc fellowship at NASA in the US for two years, because at the time the assumption was very much to get a permanent position, you would need to move countries. You had to go and try something else in the US for astronomy is a really big place to work. Two years in Washington DC, awesome city. Um, but from there I went to Germany on a postdoc fellowship um, and then spent yeah, three years there. Um, before I managed to get a postdoctoral position in Amsterdam. Also trying to solve two body issues of my husband not always being in the same place. At least in the Netherlands, we were able to finally live again in the same house, which was great. Um, and then within a year, I had a tenure track faculty position here and I have never left. I uh, did my undergraduate in Canada and I did like a joint program between engineering and physics. And I had a really nice supervisor uh, who did uh, track down quantum computing in um, that I worked with for three years when I was an undergrad. Then I went to MIT to do my PhD and afterwards I was in Boulder in Colorado and I had a very nice female uh, supervisor for my postdoc and she was very supportive. She was very understanding of her different people in her group had a different personality. Like I'm a very anxious person and uh, she was very good at sort of uh, helping me relax and, um, and, and giving me a bit more like self-belief. She recommended that I apply for this position. When I came here for uh, the interview, I found that it was a great place to, to work. And yeah, that's how I ended up here. Then I was invited by the Dutch Cancer Society to work there. They uh, needed someone urgently. So I stepped in and I stayed. That's how it goes. Working at uh, the Dutch Cancer Society, I started to realize the impact of ICT or IT in English on research, but also on our way of living, learning, working, etc. I thought, well, you know, this would be interesting to, to start with a whole new chapter in an area which is going to be really disruptive 
for uh, the whole world I'm living in. So I thought, well, let's give it a chance. And actually it was quite easy because I uh, applied for a position at um, uh, part of the NWO organization, ICT Research and Innovation it was called. And now I coordinate uh, AI research programs. Uh, this ICT um, Regie was called, was only there for five years. And after one year, when I worked there, I already had to start to think about my next step. And I started to look around and thought, well, who are my role models? You know, what is my, who is doing something I would like to do in the future? And then I started to realize in, in the whole IT community, I didn't see any women. That was the first time I really noticed that uh, there were no women. And, uh, at that time, I started to think about diversity and what I could bring in. Uh, and that also rolled on. So now I coordinate the whole diversity and inclusion policy of the whole of NWO. How I decided to live my life and structure my career was in a way that geography shouldn't be a, a major constraint. I wanted to live somewhere interesting, but it didn't necessarily have to have a, a family or an emotional tie. I wanted the challenge of like being a stranger, being a foreigner in different places and adjusting to different cultures and different experiences and different lifestyles. What happens when you go to different universities, different institutions is that people think differently. Like not, we don't all think in the same way. We don't all have the same perspective or the same understanding of the, the concept or what do we emphasize on. And, and so by being exposed to those different physics departments, it, 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 it helps me in becoming a better physicist because then I can communicate with people in different ways. And so if you're always in the same, like talking about it in the same way with the same conventions, it, like, it, I don't know, it, you gain more if you challenge yourself by going to different, different cultures, different backgrounds. It's one of the things why I decided to be an academic that I love that part of the challenge of like, uh, you never finish understanding something. You never finish understanding classical mechanics. Mm -hmm. Like F equal to MA is like, <laughs> there's so many different ways how to explain <laughs> it, so many different contexts, so many ways that it impacts how we understand things. And, and this is always evolving. Like, what do you prioritize? What do you think it's more important or more beautiful when you teach, when you use it? Uh, and your research and, and everything. I think when I was in high school, it was always like, what do scientists do? Like, <laughs> is it just like the equation is more complicated? <laughs> like there's more powers? <laughs> like in high school, like you go from like the quadratic equation and then you're like, oh, the cubic one, then it's mm -hmm. really tough. And then the quartic one. Like, <laughs> so then you think like, ah, then they just keep on going up. And like, <laughs> I don't know, it's a very like, what's the end? end? Yeah, yeah, what is the end? But then you understand, like, I don't know, then you see, like, that's not the point. It's not like it's the difficulty doesn't come because you make the thing look more complicated. Yeah, it's not the math, it's really an uh, insight, yeah. the interpretation. Well, so. it's abstraction, yeah, mm -hmm. the exactly.